Thank you for making it this far. And uh, this is Sound Effects Exploring Acoustic Cyber Weapons with Matt Whitsey. Hey, uh, hi everyone, yes, this is Sound Effects Exploring Acoustic Cyber Weapons. Uh, my name is Matt Wixey, I lead security research for PwC UK Cybersecurity Practice. Uh, I'm also a part time PhD student at University College London, which is there where this work comes from. Uh, prior to joining PwC, I worked in law enforcement in the UK for a few years and previously spoken at uh, Black Hat and DEFCON and other groups as well. So a few disclaimers before we get started, that this work was undertaken as part of my PhD research at UCL. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without my supervisors and co-authors for this project, uh, Professor Shane Johnson and Professor Emiliano de Cristofaro. Uh, what you're going to see here is presented for educational purposes only. And um, you'll also notice throughout this talk that I mention uh, words like caveat and possibly and potentially quite a lot. Um, that's come for two reasons. The first is not to kind of spread uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about the topic of this talk, but also because this is really early first stage research in an area where there's often uh, a really blurred line between correlation and causation, so that's why those caveats are there. So why this talk, why this subject? Uh, so a couple of years ago at DEF CON I did a talk called See No Evil, Hear No Evil, which was about uh, using light and sound uh, to exfiltrate data and mess with drones and bypass air gaps and that kind of thing. And as a result of that, I kind of got really interested in, uh, in ultrasound and infrasound, kind of unconventional uh, uses of sound generally. So why should you care about this talk and this topic? Uh, potentially it's a novel class of attack, which we have done some exp uh, empirical experimentation on. Uh, it's increasing attack surface as well, uh, and it builds on previous work around malware and physical harm, uh, acoustic harm more generally, and uh, digital physical crossover attacks. So a uh, brief bit of background. Um, Probably kind of one of the earliest, uh, one of the early examples is digital physical malware was Stuxnet, obviously in 2010. Um, also things like Mirai, uh, the OMT botnet, and more recently some work that was done on things like MRI machines. Um, there have been examples pre uh, prior to those of malware uh, accidentally uh, or inadvertently affecting physical kits. So the Conficker worm in 2008 affected uh, hospital equipment, as did WannaCry to some extent. Uh, there have been um, vulnerabilities found in medical implants, things like pacemakers, insulin pumps, that sort of thing, um, and various vulnerabilities in vehicles as well, which potentially would allow an attacker to take control of them um, and potentially cause harm. But typically with that kind of research, there's an indirect relationship between the attack, the effect, uh, and the uh, potential harm that's caused. And to some extent, what my research focuses on is trying to take out um, one of those steps and instead looking at malware or attacks that can directly affect human beings, either psychologically or physically. Uh, and some examples of the kind of things that would fall under that bracket uh, would be Kevin Paulson's report in 2008 on attackers who uploaded uh, flashing GIFs to an epilepsy support forum. Uh, and those GIFs flashed in patterns consistent with those known to induce uh, photosensitive epileptic seizures, and a number of people had seizures as a result. Uh, similarly, uh, Oliver Femi and others in 2013 and Ronan Shmir in 2016 looked at hacking smart light bulbs uh, and specifically found that they can make those flash again in patterns consistent with uh, photosensitive epileptic seizures. More recently, Rios and Butts in 2017, uh, in their kind of um, uh, ongoing research on IoT vulnerabilities, found that they could uh, attack an IoT car wash um, and cause it to strike a human being. So when you think about sound as a weapon, um, this isn't my job, um, this is a kind of pretty simplistic view of, of how long you should be exposed to sound at certain levels. Um, now this uses decibels, decibels is an often misunderstood measure of sound because it's not an absolute measure, it's a relative measure, it depends how far away you are from the source of the sound. But you can see when you get up to something like 115 decibels, really you can only be exposed to it for around 30 seconds before either temporary or permanent harm starts to occur. And another chart, again not mine, just shows you kind of where some of these sounds are categorised in terms of the effects that they can have. Um, so starting with um, starting with uh, 50 decibels, 
um, you have a floor fan which is kind of background noise, lawnmower chainsaw, possibly damaging sound again, depends how close you are to it. The jet taking off, uh, again, depending how close you are, could cause pain. Um, 200 decibels, potentially could be uh, instant death. And then the loudest sound known to humanity is the Windows XP startup sound. <laughs> Okay, so um, acoustics are harm and perceptibility, so what can we hear? So you've probably heard the terms ultrasound and infrasound before, and traditionally they're defined as being sounds which are either above or below uh, human thresholds of hearing. Traditionally that threshold is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, however, it's a bit of a misconception, um, as we'll see, you can't kind of put these arbitrary cutoff points here. Um, thresholds very widely and it depends a lot from person to person what frequencies you're able to hear at what stage in your life as well. Uh, in, in this talk, if you see HFN, high frequency noise, that means between 17 to 21 kilohertz, so from near ultrasound, just above true ultrasound. And if you see LFN, that means 60 to 100 hertz. The problem with, um, with ultrasound and infrasound is that basing the definition on a lack of a property is a problem. Um, because the mechanisms of people understanding high and low frequencies or perceiving um, high and low frequencies is not fully understood. People have reported being able to hear sounds as low as 1.5 hertz and as high as 25 kilohertz. Um, and there's also been some research which suggests that at some level uh, we are aware of sounds even as high as kind of 40 kilohertz, whether that's kind of consciously or subconsciously. And there is a significant variation in individuals as to what sounds you can hear. It depends on the volume, it depends on the background noise, it depends on the environment you're in, so what the walls are made of, for example. Um, you may perceive sounds in different ways to other people, so with low frequency sounds, you may feel it more as vibration than anything else. Um, you may perceive what are called audible subharmonics, which are kind of, you, know, you can think about them as kind of side effects of dominant frequency. Um, and as you um, grow older, your ability to hear higher frequencies declines. Um, so younger people, children, are, are much more likely to be able to hear higher frequencies than adults. Now there have been a lot of reported adverse effects with both high and low frequency noise. Um, these do come with a lot of caveats, um, so bear that in mind. Um, the susceptibility from person to person will differ, uh, as we've said, um, particularly with age as well. Um, there are some reports do suggest that uh, high frequencies can have an adverse effect on hearing. They can cause something called a temporary threshold shift, which is where your kind of audible range will, uh, will shift temporarily. Um, at more uh, um, increased volumes and amplitudes, there have been reported physiological changes as a result of high frequency noise, including things like cardiac neurosis, hypertension, and functional changes in cardiovascular and central nervous systems. Psychologically, high frequency noise has been reported to cause nausea, fatigue, headaches, tinnitus, nerve pain, irritation, um, and decreased amounts of concentration. These are subjective effects, so bear that in mind. Uh, with low frequency noise, it's uh, been associated with temporary threshold shifts, um, with heart ailments and insomnia, and with elevated cortisol levels. And psychologically, the most common uh, reported effect of low frequency noise is annoyance or irritation. Um, but it has also been associated with headaches and palpitations, uh, deterioration in performance, um, depressive symptoms and distress. And interestingly, these effects have been reported even at very moderate levels of sound, um, so somewhere between 40 to 45 decibels. The caveats I mentioned with all of these adverse effects, if you go back and look at the papers, uh, the data is often anecdotal. Um, it's often done through the form of questionnaires or surveys after the fact. Uh, very easily misinterpreted. We don't always know uh, the noise dose, which is the um, amount of time that someone's been exposed to these frequencies and, and at what level. Um, and many researchers have found that these effects are not reproducible in a lab environment. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why that could be. Um, the first is that there are ethical restrictions quite rightly placed on researchers exposing human subjects to sounds which they have good reason to believe could cause harm. Um, so in a lab environment, those levels would be attenuated um, and therefore might not cause the effects that have been reported in the literature. The other example is that some people may have experienced something called a nocebo effect. So they either believe uh, they're being exposed to a certain uh, level of noise or they are being exposed to it and experiencing these symptoms, but the two might not necessarily be related. 
That being said, there is a significant base, uh, evidence base, to suggest that in at least a subset of the population, high and low frequencies can cause some adverse effects. As a result of that, uh, a lot of researchers and organizations have developed exposure guidelines, which uh, are basically kind of a, um, define the maximum levels at which you should be exposed to sounds at particular frequencies. Now, there are problems with these. Uh, there are uh, big differences in the way that they're calculated and implemented. Typically, they focus solely on the workplace. They don't focus on uh, homes or public spaces or schools. Um, they're often based on very small samples, and those samples are most often uh, adult males. So they don't take into account children, for example, who, as I said, can hear uh, high frequencies at um, much, they're much more likely to be able to hear high frequencies in adults. This is a compendium of some of these guidelines. Uh, this was compiled by uh, an academic called Timothy Layton. And you can see across the top, you've got the various different frequencies. Now, these are not precise frequencies. They're the center of a, a range of frequencies called the third octave band. Um, and then on the left, you can see the uh, guidelines that go all the way back from the mid-60s right up to 2015. This isn't necessarily an exhaustive list. But just by looking at this, you can see two things. The first is that um, as you increase the frequency, the maximum exposure goes up to to some extent. The second is there's big disparities between some of these numbers because they're calculated in different ways. So just a quick thing on weighting as well. If you've ever done any sound measurement, you'll be familiar with weighting. Uh, sound weighting is a way to either attenuate or emphasize certain frequencies when you're doing a measurement of sound. Um, so A weighting is the most commonly used. If you buy a sound level meter online or a hardware store or something like that, it will most probably use A weighting. Um, and as you can see, A weighting uh, significantly underestimates lower frequency sound um, because it, it kind of the curve decays away at the start. And then uh, it also underestimates high frequency sound the case away at the end. Um, C weighting is another example. You can see there's less of a decay, but it still does decay to some extent. Um, you've also got Z weighting, which is uh, mostly what we used for this experiment because it's a flat frequency response, so it doesn't attenuate or emphasize. So, um, yeah, as I said, so with uh, A weighting, it's inappropriate for measuring high frequency noise because it underestimates those high frequencies. Um, so, Z weighting is probably much more appropriate. With low frequency noise, there are less guidelines available, fewer guidelines available. Um, a possible reason for that might be that the main effects of low frequency noise are subjective at moderate levels. Um, but again, even with the ones that have been published, the methodology used to calculate them and implement them differs a lot. So uh, for this experiment, we used a reference curve proposed by DEFRA, which um, took into account a lot of previously published curves. Um, measurements of infrasound, specifically something called G-weighting, which is an ISO standard specifically for infrasound. Because we were um, going higher than that, we didn't use G-weighting. So this is the, uh, the guideline for low frequency noise published by uh, Morehouse. Um, and as you can see, some of these levels are, are pretty low, um, particularly when you get to kind of 50 hertz, 63 hertz. Um, you're talking about kind of 43, 42 decibels. Okay, uh, so some previous work looking at sound and security research. One of the most common uh, uses of high frequency noise particularly in security research has been as a covert communications channel. Um, so Deschatels in 2014, Hans Back and Goetz also in 2014, looked at kind of covert mesh networks and how uh, devices could communicate silently with each other using high frequency noise. Uh, in my DEF CON talk a couple of years ago, I did a similar thing um, with air gap bypasses and exfiltrating data. Um, and an interesting kind of finding from a lot of this research is that many consumer devices um, are capable of emitting high frequency noise even up to kind of ultrasonic levels. There's also been uh, research looking at the disruption of echolocation systems, which use ultrasound. Um, so again, in that DEFCON talk, I showed that for drones. Um, Jan and others in 2016 for Tesla vehicles. Um, Bolton and others in 2018 looked at corrupting data being written to hard disk drives using both high frequency and kind of audible audio. And then uh, there's been a number of studies on looking at ultrasonic tracking beacons as well, which are used for, uh, for targeted marketing. So some questions I always get asked um, before we kind of get into the, the main bit of the, um, uh, the talk. First is the brown mode. Um, I, can, I, I can hear some laughs. So I, I know some people are familiar with the brown mode. If you're not familiar with it, it's this kind of mythical tone or mythical frequency that causes people to lose control of their bowels, hence the name. Um, in reality, um, no one's kind of been able to find this, this mythical frequency. Um, 
the reason for that probably is that um, any sound potentially, if it's loud enough, could cause you to feel sick, could cause your body to vibrate and potentially have that effect. Um, but there's no kind of one frequency that would work for everybody. If you're kind of playing sounds at that volume, you've probably got kind of bigger, uh, bigger worries, basically. Um, another one I get asked about as well is the link between the infrasound and the paranormal. Um, sometimes infrasound is referred to as like the ghost frequency or the horror frequency. Um, it's often, well, it's, it has been used in things like horror games and horror movies as well. Um, I'd kind of direct you to a couple of really interesting papers on this, Tandy in 2000, Parsons and others in 2008, who um, looked at the possibility of infrasound at resonant frequencies causing people to have hallucinations um, or to kind of sense a presence in areas associated with paranormal experiences. Um, it's a subject that gets debated a lot um, in, the, in that field, but it's worth kind of having a read over. Um, and the last one is the US Embassy in Cuba, and kind of what happened there. Um, I would direct you to a paper by Timothy Layton in 2018, which goes into some detail about um, the sounds that were recorded in that area and um, the possibility or not of that being a, a sonic attack. So when it comes to kind of acoustic weapons in general, there are a lot of misunderstandings around them and a lot of myths. Um, as researchers have noted, there are kind of significant practical issues associated with actually deploying them, um, which uh, to a large extent applies to this research as well. So the fact that attackers can cause something like threshold shifts is probably not of interest to them generally, um, and it's really challenging to cause kind of directional targeted effects with acoustic weapons. With low frequency noise, uh, that can propagate very easily, it can spread over miles potentially. Um, but obviously it's got very low directionality as a result, and uh, you need to build massive kind of audio equipment to be able to do that. With high frequency, it's got very low propagation, it doesn't deal with obstacles well, um, which is why it's used for echolocation, because it bounces off of objects. Um, so again, there's, there's uh, an issue there. So um, moving on to our experiment. Um, so this is kind of how we built the, um, uh, the hypothesis for this. So we said, okay, given that some high frequencies and some low frequencies might be imperceptible to at least a subset of the population, and given that above certain levels they may be associated with adverse effects, and given that some consumer equipment has been shown that it can uh, emit at least high frequency noise, possibly low frequency noise as well, is it possible, is it feasible for an attacker to develop malware that could cause a targeted device to emit these frequencies at levels exceeding those in some of these maximum guidelines and therefore potentially cause adverse effects? So a rough outline of what we did is we developed uh, attacks and malware, pretty kind of trivial uh, malware, targeted at certain devices, which was able to control the system volume and the speaker output of those devices, and as a result, play wave files containing certain frequencies, which we then measured with a sound level meter and compared that, that, compared that output uh, to maximum permissible levels. So we didn't use any human subjects for this experiment um, because of ethical restrictions, uh, quite rightly. Um, we did a full risk assessment. Um, we had various safety precautions. We wore ear defenders. We used an anechoic chamber, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and we're not releasing either code of the attacks that we did or the brands or models that we tested these attacks on. So some scenarios where an attacker might want to use this, and again, this is kind of caveated quite heavily, um, if they were seeking to affect the performance or productivity of targeted or generally uh, employees or staff of an organization, um, or at scale, um, targeted harassment of certain individuals, or potentially as kind of low-grade uh, cyber weapons that could have some physical effect. Uh, worth noting that you know, if an attacker is in a position to execute code on a device, then there are uh, more likely going to be things that they're more interested in doing. And even when it comes to sound, uh, there may be things that they're more interested in doing um, than this attack. So they may be more interested in kind of um, you know, C2 channels with that um, or something else. So just um, a description of some of the devices we tested on the left-hand side, a laptop, a phone, a Bluetooth speaker, a smart speaker, a pair of over ear headphones, uh, a vehicle-mounted public address system, a parametric speaker, and a vibration speaker. And um, you can see here some of the attack vectors and whether this was kind of remote or local. Uh, this was our anechoic chamber. Um, has anyone ever been in an anechoic chamber before? Oh wow, okay, quite a few people. It's weird, right? Like, really weird. Um, so if you haven't been, um, I really recommend you, if you get the chance to do it, do it. Um, so basically, an anechoic chamber 
is a soundproofed environment, but it's designed specifically to get rid of echoes. Um, so these kind of wedges on the walls are fiberglass wedges that, that um, bounce echoes back and forth between them so that they dissipate. Um, and essentially what this means is you can be in this room and the ambient noise level is below the threshold of human hearing. So it is kind of one of the quietest places in the world. Um, you can hear your own heart beating. If you kind of move your head, you can hear like your spine creaking in your neck. <laughs> Although that kind of might be more of something that I should get checked out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, so it is really cool. Um, and what's kind of really kind of creepy and cool about it is um, if you kind of close your eyes or you to turn the lights off, then uh, acoustically an anechoic chamber is an infinite space because there's no walls or obstacles to bounce sound off, uh, which I just think is really cool. Um, so for our uh, Windows malware, which was on laptops, we embedded these tones as WAV files, we had a really trivial C2 channel, and all the malware did uh, was it would get a command to play a certain frequency, it would increase the system volume of the laptop to 100%, play the tone for 10 minutes, and then restore the volume afterwards. Android malware did exactly the same thing. Our smart speaker, uh, the one we used, had a known vulnerability um, that allowed us to control the audio. So for this to work in practice, the attacker would need to either be on the local network um, or attack an exposed speaker on the internet or do DNS rebinding or something like that. Um, there was a Python script we used to scan for speakers on the local network and if an active stream of tone from an attacker controlled web server. The headphones um, were over headphones connected to the laptop with a Bluetooth. Because the headphones, we placed these much closer to the sound level meter. Uh, we had vibration speakers, which are really cool if you haven't used these before. Um, so these don't have a diaphragm cone. Instead, they have like a coil on a movable plate. So whatever surface you use, whatever surface you put them on, that becomes um, the kind of the source of the sound, if you like. Um, parametric speakers, again, these are really cool if you get a chance to play with these. So these use ultrasonic carrier waves at 40 kilohertz, um, meaning that you can use them for kind of quite high intensity directional audio, so kind of like a beam of sound. Um, the one we tested didn't have smart capabilities, um, but given that it was fairly low profile and fairly uh, low cost, and that it can be directional, it might be attractive to an attacker as like a portable acoustic weapon. Um, a vehicle mounted public address system, so this didn't have any network uh, interfaces, instead it also plays audio from an inserted storage device, so you would need physical access um, to it. Some additional attacks that we thought of but didn't test. The first is using uh, the HTML5 audio tag to also play audio. Um, so this would involve like a, a social engineering attack with an attacker getting a victim to visit a website and they have the sound play automatically. Um, this would obviously depend on the, the currently set system volume, um, so not guaranteed to work. And then we also used um, manipulation of pre-existing audio. So this would be uh, either something where an attacker has access to like your, uh, I guess your music collection or something, or where they're kind of creating a YouTube video that they know people are going to watch. And what you would do here is take the legitimate audio, lower the amplitude of it, and then insert a very high amplitude, uh, high frequency or low frequency sound, um, which would look like this uh, second picture here. So the kind of intended effect of this is that the victim, uh, using their headphones or speakers or whatever, would turn the sound up so that they can hear the legitimate audio and then inadvertently expose themselves to high levels of whatever frequency it is. Uh, just another illustration of that there. So for measurement, we use class one sound level meters. Um, these are precision grade, they're spot calibrated. Uh, they're really, really expensive to buy, um, but we hired them. Um, so we hired one for the low frequencies, one for the uh, high frequencies. Um, and if you ever feel like you don't have enough excitement in your life, um, have a, a courier call you and tell them that they don't have any record of you sending this stuff back um, and that you might owe a company 20,000 pounds and it puts everything else in, in perspective. <laughs> Um, so we placed each device in the anechoic chamber with our sound level meter and then via our tags we played certain frequencies um, for 10 minutes. We also measured the surface temperature of each device before and after the attack because there was some anecdotal evidence that, um, or some uh, anecdotes to suggest that particularly with higher frequencies, devices could heat up if they were playing high frequency noises. So we used Z-weighting for the measurement. Um, the only thing we didn't use Z-weighting for was for measurements at 21 kilohertz because that's outside the range of uh, Z-weighting. So we used a proprietary high-pass filter for that. And here's the results um, for high-frequency noise. 
So instances where the levels are um, above those in maximum guidelines are in bold. So you can see the smart speaker at 17 kilohertz and the headphones at 17 kilohertz and both exceeded those maximum guidelines. And then the parametric speaker did the same for 17 kilohertz, for 21 kilohertz and for 40 kilohertz as well. Now uh, what we're comparing to here is a mean average of that big list of uh, guidelines that I showed you earlier um, that was in that paper by Timothy Layton. So you can see things like the laptop and the phone are not capable of producing sound exceeding those maximum guidelines. So it's a minority of devices um, in a minority of frequencies that are capable of doing this. With low frequency noise, a uh, similar story, so again a minority of devices. Here is the Bluetooth speaker at two of those frequencies, a uh, smart speaker at all three, and the headphones at 100 hertz. Now, uh, particularly when you get to kind of the upper range of um, the, this, this kind of low frequency noise, this might be more audible um, and would therefore be less suitable as kind of a covert attack. Um, and I'll speak a bit about aud audibility uh, in a minute. Some other results of interest, so the vibration speaker uh, is no good for low frequency because it vibrates so much that it falls over. Um, so every time we open the, the chamber door, the speaker's lying on the floor. Um, the smart speaker, uh, when we open the chamber, there's a really strong smell of burning plastic. Um, and when we kind of tested this, um, we found that it was actually permanently damaged. So this is kind of what happened in the 10 minutes um, that this smart speaker was being tested. You can see the damage starts to occur in like the second minute. This was at uh, 17 kilohertz. After five minutes, there's some sort of critical event where a component burns out. And then immediately the, the decibel level drops uh, and never recovers. And what we, had, we actually found was that we had permanently damaged the speaker. Um, and we had made it unable to reproduce frequencies above five kilohertz. Um, so we took recordings of music um, before we did the test and after we did the test and looked at the spectrograms. Uh, and on the top is before the test and on the bottom is after the test. So uh, this is a permanent effect as well. So we've kind of permanently impaired that speaker. Um, I'd love to be able to play it to you because it's copyrighted, I can't. Um, but it kind of sounds like someone um, singing underwater or in kind of like a metal uh, tank or something like that. So it kind of really makes a difference to audio quality. So we reported that to the manufacturers who were really responsive and they told us that um, updates have been rolled out to address it. To address it, sorry. Um, now looking at audible components, because this is kind of a key thing for this attack, um, part of kind of the premise of this as a successful attack is relying on the fact that users wouldn't be able to hear it. So depending on the device, you get more or less audible components in kind of audible ranges. If you look at headphones, for example, this big spike to the right is the target frequency, which was 17 kilohertz, so that's kind of an intended effect. Um, and then you can see to the left, you've got kind of um, uh, different frequencies there, um, which are pretty low. So if you're wearing headphones and, and this happens, you might kind of notice something, it might appear as kind of distortion or popping or something like that, but um, it wouldn't be that noticeable. Conversely, if you look at the parametric speaker, um, the intended tone is still high, but there are uh, much higher levels of other more audible frequencies, which means this would be kind of less suited for some kind of stealthy attack. So implications of this with the headphones, um, then it's a significant concern because headphones are increasingly used, particularly like, by young people, high volumes, and to some extent they're device agnostic, so you can kind of plug, plug it into a laptop or a phone or something. Um, it might be possible for an attacker to kind of in, in, uh, improve that malware by, for instance, only triggering certain frequencies when uh, headphones are connected, um, so when that kind of device registers. Um, with the parametric speaker, um, it does produce a lot of audible components, but it might be attractive to some attackers as kind of a portable low cost acoustic weapon. In any case, the fact that it's using kind of those ultrasonic carrier waves at 40 kilohertz at pretty high levels means that it could be a uh, public health risk. With the Bluetooth and smart speakers, um, more difficult to attack with the Bluetooth speakers. You obviously need to kind of pair with them. Uh, with the smart speakers, though, um, we can permanently damage them with the high frequency noise. Um, potentially, that burning out of components could be a fire hazard as well, um, and other models might be vulnerable. So, in terms of feasibility, um, the attacks that we discovered were viable on a minority of devices. So out of the, the kind of 10 tests that we did, you're talking about kind of a handful of two to four devices. Um, for this attack to succeed, you're relying on attackers, not, I'm sorry, on victims not perceiving uh, the sound, on them being susceptible to the adverse effects of that sound, um, and for them being exposed for long enough to the sound for it to have an effect. Remember that our tests were only 10 minutes. 
So for example, if I kind of played a 20 kilohertz tone in this room now, uh, you know, a fairly high level, um, some of you would hear it and, and not be affected by it. Some of you would hear it and probably feel uncomfortable. Some of you wouldn't hear it and wouldn't notice. Some of you wouldn't hear it and might feel uncomfortable. So it's a real kind of spectrum. Um, so yeah, there's kind of a lot of obstacles for an attack to overcome for this, uh, for this attack to work. And as I said, some attacks require kind of physical or local access as well. And crucially, attackers might be interested or more interested in other avenues. Um, so if they have kind of code execution on a laptop, for instance, or a phone, it's likely that there's other stuff they're interested in. Um, OK, so moving on to countermeasures. So uh, Desha tells in 2014 uh, suggested a number of kind of applicable countermeasures for these kind of attacks. The first is to limit the frequency range of speakers. So many speakers have a frequency range that uh, goes up to kind of 20 kilohertz or above, um, which in most cases is not needed, uh, depending on what you're using them for. Uh, visibly alerting users when speakers are in use by an app or a software program. Doing some kind of filtering uh, during processing to remove high or low frequency noise if it's not needed. And uh, with mobile specifically, some kind of permissions restriction so that if an app wants to use the speaker, you have to kind of explicitly grant it permission to do so. On the heuristic side, um, it's very rare that an application, a legitimate application, would need access to volume levels. We kind of thought of it a few examples, one would be like a muting app, for instance. And there are some legitimate uses potentially for ultrasound, so Google Nearby Messages uses uh, ultrasound in addition to some other comms channels. Um, but generally speaking, um, there's kind of not many legitimate use cases for that. You can monitor the environment for high or low frequency noise. Um, so most consumer sound level meters will not go as high or low um, as the levels we tested, and you do need specialist equipment. That being said, there are a couple of Android apps that we used in our pilot study, uh, ultrasound detector and infrasound detector, which we used with a, a pretty cheap external microphone for the Android. Um, and there is some studies that suggest um, that modern smartphones might be okay for occupational noise measurement at least, um, as long as you kind of accept that there are caveats with that and limitations and that you won't necessarily get a 100% accurate result. Uh, we developed a proof of concept uh, Windows program um, that listens to sound uh, coming in from your laptop microphone and pops up an alert if it hears frequencies uh, above a certain level and above a certain amplitude. Um, it's adapted from another open source application. Um, we are going to kind of release this on GitHub in uh, either this evening or tomorrow morning, but obviously don't use it to evaluate if there's actual risk uh, of damage or adverse effects to you um, or for safety of the assessments. If that's something you want to do, then you should really be speaking to a trained professional who's got the right equipment. Um, but the uh, application will be available there. It, uh, its accuracy and its kind of performance does depend a lot on the uh, microphone you're using, the sound card you're using, and that kind of stuff. Um, but if you want to have a play with it and kind of see how it works, then uh, please do. At the, um, at the policy level, um, it's really important that uh, I think that these guidelines are reviewed um, and that there's some kind of standardisation um, put in place for these. Um, because, as noted before, they're often inadequate due to their methodology. The fact that they underestimate certain frequencies because of the weighting that's been used, um, the fact that they are predominantly around occupational context and the samples are very small based on adult men, um, and in no way kind of um, give you any kind of uh, indication if you're somewhere outside of an occupational context as to what sounds are kind of tolerable for health. Um, depending on what area of the country you're in, or sorry, depending on what area of the world you're in, um, you may have legislation that pertains to uh, sound exposure, um, whether that's low frequency, high frequency, or just in general. Um, and ideally, your employers would, um, as uh, a result of that, conduct regular checks. So uh, to sum up then, um, this was a first stage bit of research uh, on a very small scale. We looked at a very limited number of devices. We looked at very short exposure times of 10 minutes um, without human experimentation. There's also the note that like the smart speaker, uh, if a device is forced to continually play high or low frequency noise, then it may burn out anyway, um, but it may take kind of several days for that to happen. Um, so we also didn't do any human experimentation on uh, perceptibility as to whether uh, humans would be able to actually be able to hear the sound. And that's just the kind of limitation of research in this field generally. Um, 
because of kind of ethical concerns. So more research is definitely needed on uh, the risk of high frequency and low frequency noise. Um, that could include like a wider range of equipment. Um, so in addition to testing um, the devices that we tested, you could look at things like IP phones, for example, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be an attack against them. It might just be kind of injecting uh, tones into a conversation. Um, you could look at kind of uh, attacks on a larger scale, whether that's something like uh, a kind of uh, worm attack against you know 50 laptops in a soundproofed environment, or whether it's looking at kind of big devices like um, public address systems um, on a big scale, though logistically obviously that would come with some challenges. Um, testing this overheating effects on other devices would be really cool to see if that's, um, that's something that's common across a lot of speakers. Um, some more work on countermeasures. So, you know, one of the encouraging things about this research is that uh, whilst the attacks we developed are pretty trivial, there are a lot of caveats around it, and the countermeasures are also trivial um, in, in, in many um, cases. So that's kind of encouraging as well. Obviously, the ethical restrictions do make kind of extrapolation to real-world effects pretty challenging. Um, it's difficult to be able to say whether or not these attacks would actually allow you, uh, allow an attacker to have any effect on people um, because there are so many variables. Um, so we've only kind of really scratched the surface in terms of what can be done in this field. Um, so definitely if you're kind of interested in this field, you want to kind of chat about it a bit more then, then get in touch with me. So just to sum up, um, so it's likely that um, attackers might become increasingly interested in leveraging vulnerabilities against humans um, and they kind of have digital physical effects. Certainly the attack surface for these devices is likely to grow and potentially any device with a speaker, um, obviously depending on what kind of its sound card and, and um, complexity, could be used for this kind of attack. Um, and crucially, the lack of consensus around kind of adequate safety guidelines is a real challenge. However, as I said, kind of countermeasures are available, they will work, um, and the real world consequences of this attack are something that's yet to be uh, as attacked. So, um, thank you very much. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, that's my Twitter handle and my email address. Um, I'm going to take questions uh, at the far end of the hall, uh, in the hallway. Um, if you're interested in any of this stuff, there is uh, an exhaustive list of references at the end of the slide, um, at the end of the slide deck, um, which cover kind of acoustic weapons, ultrasound, infrasound, human effects of those, um, and various other bits and pieces as well. Um, I can play with more references if you're interested, um, but there you go, some summer reading for you. So, um, thank you very much for listening, um, and as I said, I'll take questions at the back, and thank you very much. Subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed this video, or learned something, and comment below what you found interesting.